Hello, language arts class. Mr. Spaeth back with chapter 26 from Mr. Kermit's point of view. So things kind of finally uh, caught up with Kiana Rubini in chapter 25. And um, as I, if you remember from chapter 24 when I read that, I kind of predicted that that would kind of be uh, the downfall of Mr. Kermit and with the kids at SCS 8. So let's see um, kind of the fallout from that. Chapter 26, Mr. Kermit. I never thought it could be like this again. Every morning, as I parked the Coco Nerd, good as new, or at least good as 27 years old, I can't wait to get into the classroom. There's a spring in my step. I'm practically jogging. At the coffee pot in the faculty lounge, I fill the toilet bowl only halfway. I don't need coffee to stay awake. I'm firing on all cylinders, as jumping Jake Terranova might say. Even that name doesn't sour me the way it once did. I'll never be able to forgive the cheating scandal. But there's no denying the role Jake played in turning a class around. The class. Just the thought of them sends a jolt of electricity up my spine. Who could have guessed that the rejects of the whole district would turn out to be exactly what I needed? The unteachables. Well, not anymore. Oh, sure, there are better students in this world. Okay. They're better students in this hallway, but comparing what they've become to what they started out as, it's clear that something very special is happening, and their teacher has to believe in something I haven't believed in for a long time, myself. It was the state science assessment that did it for me. There was a moment at the beginning, Parker in his usual pose, hunched low over his exam booklet, staring as if to see inside the individual molecules of paper. Hose hypnotist, he was mumbling, struggling to make sense of the letters on the page. Hose hypnotist. Then all those hours of reading support kicked in. Photosynthesis, he exclaimed triumphantly. I had to hold myself back from cheering out loud. Jake actually took test day off so he could get so he could be with the class to provide moral support. In reality, he was more stressed out than the students and putting everybody on edge. Eventually, I had to coax him into the hall and tell him to go back to the dealership. He protested. But what if they... You... Bereft of speech, he threw his arms around me. This was not something I ever wanted to happen. Go, I told him, wriggling free. Sell cars, jump through hoops. You're the best teacher ever, Jake declared emotionally. I'm so sorry I did, you know, the thing. Goodbye, Jake. More memories of that morning. Looking out over my students, and suddenly the whole room was blurry because my eyes were filled with tears. Just like they dove into the river because they thought I was drowning, they dove into this, and they did it for me. They had no way of knowing my job was on the line. That made it all the more impressive. I said this was important, and the kids took my word for it. They even studied. As I walked between the desk, peering over shoulders, the scratch of number two pencils filling in olds made my heart swell to bursting. I knew it then, and the feeling has only gotten stronger since. I love these students. Parker, Aldo, Elaine, Barnstorm, Rahim, and Mateo. And Kiana, who, it turns out, isn't even really in the class, or any class. That's my fault. I'm the one who never bothered to glance at my own attendance list long enough to realize that my student wasn't on it. How blind I was. How burnt out and detached. On the other hand, who expects a kid to come to a school she isn't signed up for? Her stepmother straightened everything out, Christina Vargas explains at our meeting the week after the test. Kiana's only here for a couple of months, and the registration process was too much red tape. So she blundered into your class and figured she'd be gone by the time anybody figured out she didn't belong. It's ridiculous, but almost understandable. My cheeks got hot. I suppose that doesn't make me look very on top of things. We're all at fault, the principal says kindly. I had her progress report right in my hand. I remember struggling to put it face to the name, but I never took it any further. Well, I'm not sorry it happened, I go on. She's a fantastic kid and a brilliant student. Look at her score in the exam, 96. She sets a positive example for the rest of the class. My voice trails off. 
Christina's face has turned ashen. I take a guess at the reason. Are you moving her? Because her science score proves she doesn't belong with my kids? I'm not moving her, she replies grimly. Her stepmother specifically asked that Kiana stay with you. Demanded, actually. But there's something else. I sit back, waiting. Christina takes a deep breath. This is difficult, Zachary. I hate to be the person who has to give you the news. The truth is, you won't be a teacher here much longer. It comes so far out of left field that I'm shocked into silence at first. Then, light dawns. Thaddeus? The science test? But the scores were good. Kiana's alone. That's just it, she tells me. You know Dr. Thaddeus wants you gone. As soon as he realizes what was happening with the Robini girl, he had her result disallowed. Even without her, I insist. The others have made so much progress. Progress, Surely their grades are enough. Almost, she says sadly. Remember, Dr. Thaddeus has access to every test these kids have taken since preschool. He can cherry-pick exactly the numbers he needs to make sure you can't win. It reminds me of an old saying I heard somewhere. Figures don't lie, but liars figure. Devastated. The principal removes an envelope from her desk drawer and hands it over. Dr. Thaddeus dropped it off this morning. I pleaded with him, Zachary. I pointed out how close they came to making it, even though he stacked the odds against them. I raved about how absolute zero works was expected of these kids, so any proficiency at all is a credit to a remarkable teacher. He couldn't have cared less. He said even if they had fallen short by one millionth of one percent, it wouldn't have changed anything. She's still talking, weeping practically, but I can't make out any of it. It's like I'm in a tunnel and the echoes are rattling around but not quite reaching me. Fingers numb, I fumble the letter out of the envelope. Notice of termination. Attention. Kermit. Zachary. Please be advised that pursuant to Article 12, subsection 9 of the Greenwich Teachers Association contract, your services will no longer be required as of t- December 22nd of the current school year. My eyes skip down the page, bouncing off terms like poor performance, unacceptable results, and ineffective educator. I can't bring myself to read it all, but the message is painfully clear. This magical semester, in which I turned my own life around as much as a student's, was nothing but a tease. It raised my hopes, only to dash them to pieces at my feet. It restored my faith in teaching and in myself purely so the taste would be all the more bitter now. I'm fired, sacked, kicked to the curb, canned, given the boot, as of December 22nd. Merry Christmas. Worst of all, my career is going to end six months too soon to qualify me for early retirement. Fade to black. I barely hear Christina's tearful words of sympathy as I wander out of her office. Instead of heading to room 117, I stagger through the main doors and find the parking lot. I can't face the kids. Not now, when I'm still so stunned. What would I say to them? How could I explain it? I don't blame them for the superintendent's malice. But how could I ever convince them that this isn't their fault? I'll have to find those words eventually, but not today. The outside world sounds different than it usually does. Subdued, muffled. Somehow, my feet carry me to the Coco Nerd, and I climb behind the wheel. The locks haven't worked in more than a decade. The car starts in its customary cloud of burned oil. Outside, it begins to rain, and I activate the lone functioning wiper. Too bad it isn't the one on the driver's side. I squint through the water-spatted windshield. At least it's forcing me to watch the road. Otherwise, I'd probably wrap the coconut around a telephone pole. At the entrance to the parking lot, I signal left and press the gas. There's a loud pop followed by a clatter, and everything else goes quiet. I try the key a few more times. Nothing. Not even a feeble attempt to catch. The turn signal clicks once more, and then it dies too. I get out of the car and open the hood. To my amazement, nothing's there. 
On closer inspection, I spy the motor lying on the pavement next to the battery. The radiator, the transmission, and a lot of other stuff that used to be attached to the car. Over a quarter century with a Coco Nerd, and I thought I'd seen it all. Wrong again. This is an ex Coco Nerd. It's raining harder, and I'm getting soaked. There's probably something I should be doing, but what? Call a tow truck? Why? This heap of scrap metal isn't really a car anymore. Inform the school that their driveway is blocked? They'll figure it out sooner or later. I flip up the collar of my jacket and start walking toward home.